uh, we'll have a tandem talk from Dean Morton and Phil Quirk, who both are going to tell us how we should treat now and maybe in the future colon cancer in regards to chemotherapy. And Dion is going to start. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dieter, for that generous uh, introduction. And it's a huge pleasure to be here. And it's particularly a pleasure to uh, have the opportunity to represent the collaboration of the Foxtrot investigators who carried out what is, uh, I think, a remarkable trial and one that's going to really uh, make us rethink our management of colon cancer going forward. Um, I think it would be very exciting to work with you in the audience to see how we might move forward from this. We're going to, um, in football talk, we're going to have a game of three halves. And uh, I'm going to start by just giving you the primary outcome results from the Foxtrot trial. And then Phil's going to come and tell you about the histological findings and their implications. And then we'll finish by giving you a flavor of what we think the future uh, might hold. So without any more ado, uh, the usual disclosures, just to say uh, there was uh, an uh, unconditional grant from Amgen, which uh, underwrote some of the translational research, but I won't be talking about that today. I would like to firstly acknowledge the huge team of people across three countries that carried out uh, this study over a period of 10 years. It felt like longer. And, uh, but it has built a really fantastic multidisciplinary team of collaborators that can work on colon cancer over forthcoming years. So I like this uh, graph. It's, uh, it shows the uh, massive improvement in uh, st uh, age standardized mortality from colorectal cancer over the last 50 years. And what it shows you actually is here, this is the improvement due to safe anesthesia. And here, this is actually the improvement due to early diagnosis when we introduced uh, early diagnosis. So there's no massive improvement really that's, that's identifiable from chemotherapy. And my oncology colleagues would say that um, actually since 2004, we've had no real advances in chemotherapeutic uh, treatment of colon cancer since the introduction of combined chemotherapy. And that's uh, a shame because I think the opportunity is there for us to, uh, to make significant improvements, potentially by introducing the chemotherapy earlier. So a neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy has the potential to reduce uh, incomplete resection rates by shrinking the tumor. It may treat micrometastases not just earlier, but before the immune compromising effects of uh, surgery. And I think this is an interesting one going forward, which is the opportunity to assess response at the time of surgery. So almost to use surgery as a, the resected specimen as a biomarker of what treatment they might need postoperatively. But we've never done it, and the reason that we've never done it, despite benefits being shown in many other GI cancers, and certainly benefits in terms of breast cancer. So I think there are three reasons, and we need to acknowledge them, why it's not been done before. The first was the worries about drug resistance and tumor progression and obstruction in the preoperative phase. And of course, the improved response rates from dual chemotherapy uh, helped to uh, diminish those worries. In the oncologist's uh, mind, there is a huge worry about over-treatment with chemotherapy and giving people chemotherapy that they don't need. I, I always think unbundling cancer care into single modalities is probably a mistake. And we have to look at the combined toxic effects or the combined downside of surgery and chemotherapy together. And then worries about surgical morbidity. And I think that that is, has been a great uh, uh, preventer of progress in this area because we surgeons believe that colon cancer surgery is relatively safe and that colon cancer surgery has relatively good outcomes. And so giving people neoadjuvant therapy is more likely to do harm than good. And I think those concerns are not unreasonable. 
So here's the Foxtrot trial. And I, I'm working on the assumption that uh, many of you know this trial already. And uh, in fact, many of you, of course, in the room are the collaborators that actually drove this trial through. And it's a very simple trial. It's a trial of six weeks of preoperative chemotherapy, combination uh, of oxaloplatin and 5-FU. Uh, followed by surgery, followed by completion of chemotherapeutic course versus standard treatment of surgery and adjuvant therapy. The primary uh, disease outcome was taken at two years, and we were looking at a, a hazard ratio of 0.75, so we're looking to reduce recurrence by 25% at two years. And that was, I'll just highlight to you, we were anticipating a 32% uh, recurrence rate at two years uh, based on published data. And secondary outcomes of resection rate safety and downstaging. We also ran an optional uh, targeted therapy trial of panitumumab in RAS wild type patients, and that was focused only on downstaging as the primary endpoint. And that data is not yet analyzed, so I won't be discussing it further today. And these patients underwent surgery, and the first thing that we wanted to show is that we could or could not give chemotherapy safely in the preoperative setting. And I would remind you, we only gave three cycles of chemotherapy for six weeks, which is a very short course, and that was for safety reasons. And I've highlighted here that not only did we not see any adverse effects that were measurable in our target population, but we actually saw evidence of some benefit. If you look at the complications requiring further surgery, patients going back for emergency surgery was reduced from 7% in, in, the, in, the, in the control arm to 4.3% in the neoadjuvant arm. And from, from here on in, the red column denotes the neoadjuvant, the novel arm, and the green column denotes the uh, control arm. And I will remind you, for the absolute numbers, that they were randomized two to one in order to maximize our experience of the neoadjuvant arm. So complications were reduced by 40%. And when we look at why that, reoperation was reduced by 40%. And when we look at why that might be, it's probably because the anastomotic leak rate was actually reduced by a similar amount. And that was associated with a reduction in reduced prolonged complications, prolonging hospital stay. So it makes sense. It's not entirely clear why the anastomotic leak rate might be reduced, but that's something you might want to ask us questions about later. So safety, the rate of major surgical complications were lower after neoadjuvant therapy. Not worse, but actually lower. What about completeness of resection? So at operation, when we undertook our surgery, was it hampered by the patients having chemotherapy beforehand? Or was shrinking the tumor actually beneficial? And this table, again using the red and green for neoadjuvant and control, shows the difference in outcomes for those two patient groups. So the numbers of patients who did not proceed to surgery for any reason, was the same in both arms. So we did not see progression, measurable progression or advancement of disease or patients deteriorating on chemotherapy so they couldn't go to surgery. When they went to surgery, what proportion of patients had no resection? Well, actually, that was uh, reduced by 60% from over 1% of cases down to 0.3% of cases, a big reduction for a small number of patients. What about the number of patients who had incomplete, macroscopically incomplete resections? Again, that was reduced by 60%, down from over 1% to 0.3%. And then microscopically uh, involved margins. Now, this wasn't involved margins. This was resection margin within one millimeter of the resection margin, tumor within one millimeter. That was actually reduced from eight, by 50%, from 8% down to 4%. What does that mean? Well, if you take it as a whole, if I was a patient undergoing surgery uh, with a neoadjuvant therapy, my chances of uh, achieving an R0 resection at the time of surgery reduced from 11% down to 4.8%. Um, 
I think if I'm honest with you, and I hope I am, that that's far greater response than we ever envisage from such a tiny course of chemotherapy. The second question, when we're delivering a treatment plan, if you think of us in surgery, we're delivering a treatment plan to remove the tumor. Otherwise, what's the point in doing the operation? We're we're doing it to remove the tumor. The other part of the treatment plan is actually delivering the chemotherapy. And this is a really important point. Only 4% of patients in the neoadjuvant arm didn't receive chemotherapy. And that was almost entirely because the surgeon and the oncologist decided they were fearful of giving the chemotherapy and they went to surgery. And actually, that was mostly in the early stages when we didn't have experience of neoadjuvant therapy and we were all clinically cautious about it. Whereas if we look at the patients who went straight to surgery, 27% never received any chemotherapy in the post-operative period. Now, that was for multiple reasons. I'm not suggesting it was all for one. But actually, in half of those patients, nearly half of those patients, adjuvant chemotherapy was not given because the the patient was not fit for it, even though they had very advanced disease at the time of resection. Almost half of those patients. So at at absolute minimum of 11% of patients did not receive chemotherapy, any chemotherapy, because they could not... uh, Uh, they were not fit enough to receive it. The primary outcome at two years. You'll notice that the recurrence rate at two years was 17%, significantly lower than we had predicted. Nonetheless, the hazard ratio, that is the reduction of, uh, 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 of recurrence, was actually met the hazard ratio of 25%. And the confidence interval is 0.55 to 1.04. So it just crosses the midline. So it did not reach our predicted uh, statistically significant mark. But taking it the other way around, there's a 92% chance that that is significant and that that is real. And you'll notice that the curves going out to five years are still separating. So very encouraging. Here's the... uh, uh, the forest plot, just looking at uh, for heterogeneity, and there's three things I'm going to highlight on this. In terms of the tumor location, that is right-sided versus left-sided, you'll see there is less of an effect in the right-sided tumors, and we're going to talk about that in a moment. In, the, in terms of tumor stage, actually, if anything, there is a bigger effect in more advanced disease, which is really quite surprising. If you all think to your rectal cancer, then actually the effects of radiotherapy are more pronounced on early stage disease. But in this, that doesn't seem to be the case, but we can talk about that in a moment. And then the third group is age. And if anything, older patients were getting more benefit, not less benefit than younger patients from the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Something we'll come back to in a moment. When we look at overall survival and colon cancer-specific survival, you'll find that you'll see that both of those curves continue to stay separate. I'm actually quite surprised that the survival curves stay separate out to six years, although obviously the numbers aren't enough to show statistical significance. However, the colon cancer-specific mortality is still separating out at six years and is very close to uh, statistical significance. And those, that, that is an interesting finding, and not one that I would have anticipated from simply shifting three s- cycles of chemotherapy into the preoperative arm. Again, something we might want to talk about. So the primary endpoint wasn't met, but we did show the target hazard ratio of 0.75. And there is a, a, a highly... Uh, um, um, suggestive trend towards improved survival, both uh, overall and um, colon cancer-specific survival. Now, just one sensitivity analysis for you, and that is to say, you might well ask, could this have been due to the panatumumab? So it wasn't actually the neoadjuvant therapy, it was actually a small group of tumors who were responding to panatumumab. And actually, there were 279 patients who received panatumumab out of the 1,052 patients in the trial. And when we look at that, in practice, 
the numbers of uh, observation that the number of recurrences in this group was 18 versus 15, and the 2p value is 0.4, and there's no way that that data has actually significantly influenced the primary endpoint of the trial. So the effect that we're seeing are down to oxaloplatin and 5-FU. And panitumab is not the cause of those effects. So in conclusion, we've shown firstly that three cycles of combination chemotherapy can be given safely, even in older patients. It improves surgical outcome, uh, not something we would have anticipated, both adverse events and in terms of re resection clearance. And this chemotherapy is very well tolerated with a low tech toxicity. And it's really only when I studied this that I realized, of course, chemotherapy toxicity is cumulative. So the shorter courses you give, the better the outcomes. It's a bit like why short course radiotherapy with early surgery, they haven't accumulated the toxicity by the time you operate. So they tend to have a better outcome. And the data strongly su supports long-term benefit, even showing possible benefit in colon cancer-specific survival. So I think we have two questions, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, uh, Phil Quirk. One question is, how is this working? Why is this, ke this neoadjuvant chemotherapy having this effect? And perhaps equally important, can we predict which patients are most likely, or even more important, least likely to benefit from these treatments? And I think the answers to these questions lie with histopathology. And who better to ask to answer those questions than my good friend, Phil Quirk? Phil, welcome. <laughs> OK, so um, just to say, uh, Thank you to Dion for his leadership of this very interesting trial and having uh, the guts to do this trial. We have uh, pathology contributions um, from the pathologists around the UK, Sweden, Denmark. Uh, Kigo Murakami uh, was a Japanese fellow in our department who did a vast amount of the pathology review for us. Nick West uh, contributed greatly. Susan Richmond and Henry with the molecular biology in Leeds for the RAS testing. And then uh, I made a contribution. Then Philip Tannier in Birmingham for the RAS testing as well. We split them. And then Brian Warren, uh, who many of you will remember, contributed to the protocol and the pathology training before his uh, untimely death. So 91% of the materials being collected, scanned, and reviewed centrally. So we had a great pathology trial. Thank you, pathologists. We had uh, training sessions for judging quality of surgery and the quality of pathology examination that we expected from the pathologists. We had a trial protocol. Uh, we then, when we collected the slides, we've scanned them. They're up on our website. You can actually look at the pathological responses there. You can go in and, and see them. Go into the slides. And where we have the macroscopic photographs, you can see them. Uh, and then we can see all the histology here. And here's a, a larger size macroscopic, and here is the histology. So we have a great set of material, and we've therefore been able to do some very interesting stuff. So are we seeing an effect in the tumors with only the six weeks of chemotherapy? And what's fascinating is, yes, we are. And these are all in the same format that Dion showed. So here we have the neoadjuvant chemotherapy group, which is double the size of the straight to surgery group. So this is what you would be expecting without the chemotherapy. And what we see is 4.1% of the cases are PT0. The tumor, the primary tumor has disappeared. PT1, PT2, 11.7% is a doubling. PT3, about the same, but our PT4s, as Dion highlighted, have dropped from nearly 30% to about 20%. So a significant change in the primary T stage of the tumor. What else do we see? We see the maximum tumor diameter dropping by 15 millimeters in the treated patients. We see the spread beyond the muscularis, which is a prognostic factor, shrinking from five millimeters to four millimeters on average. And then really interestingly, the extramural vascular invasion is dropping. This is giving us some very hard evidence for the rationale of adjuvant therapy. We can actually see the extramural vascular invasion going from 45 to 32.3%. 
then what's happening to those nodes? Well, what we see is our PN zeros are now up to 60% versus 48%, 49%. Our PN1s here the same, but our PN2s have dropped from 25.9% to 15.2%, a very significant reduction. And then if you go back to the old Duke's C2, the apical node positive, we've seen a halving of that important parameter, so 7.5% to 3.8%. So we're seeing downstaging of the primary tumour, we're seeing downstaging of the extramural vascular invasion, and we're seeing downstaging of the nodal involvement. So very significant changes just for those three courses of chemotherapy. And if we look further about the features in the lymph nodes, we see that the number of lymph nodes uh, that we find in the pre and post have dropped from, to 23.2 from 25.7. This is probably because those lymph nodes are getting smaller. The lymph node metastasis positive has dropped from 48.2 to 38.5%. Not only that, but the number of metastatic nodes that you have have dropped from 2.5 to 1.5. The maximum size of the tumour in the lymph nodes, drops from 9 millimetres to 6.6 millimetres, and then the average size of tumour in the lymph nodes also drops. So we're definitely seeing an uh, impact on the nodal disease. And here is the wonderful histology we see in that we have complete regression in a small number of patients. And this is not because the tumour wasn't there, because we can see the histological features of where the tumour was. So here are two cases of complete regressions. And what you see, here's the muscularis propria, muscularis propria, and you see the fibrosis here, where the tumour was. And again down here, you see the same, and there's a serosal reaction over that tumour. These are excellent regressions where tumour cells are very hard to find. And you see exactly the same thing. Here is where the destroyed tumour was. Uh, and there are just a few little glands left here and in this one here. And then we get the moderate regressions, which to all and intensive purposes looks the same as if you're giving radiotherapy with delay. And then we unfortunately have the group of patients who aren't responding at all. There's no regression at all to these three cycles of chemotherapy. And again, we'll probably come back to them because they're a very important group. So this is where we get to the really interesting stuff about tumour regression grade. And what we have is the effects of the neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and I will put up the effects of the controls. In TNM8, we only have four categories, not five, and that's because pathologists cannot reliably distinguish between little regression and no regression. So that is a good thing to do. But what's interesting is that we used the five because that was what was being used at the time when the trial was set up. And this actually does give us extra information, which you will see as we go through. So here we have, when you treat them, a 3.5% complete response rate. All the tumour is gone with just those three cycles of chemo. Mark regression, 4.1%. This means you've got very few tumour cells left. Moderate regression, 12.3%. And then we see this little regression at 43.9%, and no regression here in 34%. Now, when we put up the control arm... What you see is exactly what you would expect, that we see no clinical responses because you haven't given any chemotherapy. We see no marked regression. And we just see this, probably a single case, being identified as moderate regression. And this is probably a stromal-rich tumour, which we know exists. And then when we have the little regression and the no regression, you can see that actually uh, it, we can't tell the difference between these two uh, in the... Uh, in the straight-to-surgery arm, but we're seeing in the chemo more in this group, suggesting that actually we are having you know, a, an effect there. So having five grades does help us in distinguishing what's going on. This is statistically significant. So we are seeing a uh, response. This is really exciting. I was very pleased to see this. I didn't expect it. Uh, it looks too good to be true, but it's fascinating. This is the proportion free of relapse out to five years. And the complete responders in blue, no failures at all. But they have had that tumour area resected. The marked regression, the moderate regression, the mild regression, and the no regression. 
very stratified. So the response that we're seeing in those tumors seems to stratify their long-term outcome. So fascinating and very nice to see. So the efficacy conclusions, we're getting major downstaging with lower risk of incomplete resection, and the tumor regression grade appears to be a good predictor of long-term outcome after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So if we look at the panitumumab effects, um, that Dion has already shown you, but I will show you the uh, pathology, that what we see is uh, the pre-op 5-FU and oxaliplatin alone versus using that 5-FU and oxaliplatin plus the panitumumab. And what you see is that we, well, we don't see, we get some complete response here. Uh, we get some marked regression, some moderate regression. We're seeing very little difference between this. There is no indication from the pathology that the panitumumab is adding anything in here to just the 5-FU alone. So that um, matches what Dion showed you. Now, this is a subgroup analysis, so you have to take it with a pinch of salt. There has been, long been a debate uh, between deficient mismatch repair and proficient mismatch repair and chemosensitivity. So this is a subset analysis of the PMMR versus the DMMR in the group only that's received the preoperative uh, chemotherapy and then the subsequent chemotherapy. So we're looking at the effect in the DMMRs of that six weeks and in the PMMRs of those six weeks. And what do we see? Well, this was very surprising to me we actually see very interesting features. Firstly, we see the complete responders are the same in both those groups. So I'd just put that to one side for a minute and then look at the rest of it. If you look at the rest of it, this group then looks very similar to the untreated patients in that we're not seeing the uh, marked regression and the moderate regression that we see in these PMMRs, which is you know, the chemotherapy effect. We're not seeing this. And this, to me, indicates possibly two things. That the complete response mechanism is by some mechanism that we do not understand at the moment and needs further investigation. Uh, but I think there may, there's a, a second cause for this. But actually, the DMMRs do not seem to be demonstrating any response to that chemotherapy. So it does seem to stratify the patients that if you have uh, these DMMRs that you do not get response, apart from this little group up here at uh, which we see response in both PMR and DMMR. And when you look at uh, the effect of NAC on two-year relapse by MMR status, the hazard ratio drops to 0.69 because, of course, we've taken out the DMMRs, which are not responding, so it's increasing the uh, significance of this, uh, this component. So the DMMRs were out at 1.04, so it's on the wrong side. So the subgroup analysis conclusions at the moment that no regression in most of the DMMR tumours and no benefit seen at two years, and the PMMR tumours borderline significant impact on the two-year endpoint. So I'll now hand back to Dion, who will discuss these results. Thank you very much, Phil. Oh. <laughs> so it's exciting. These are, are really uh, very... Uh, interesting results and they have a huge potential impact. So the primary endpoint hit the hazard ratio, but the confidence interval just crossed one. When you look at the mismatch repair proficient tumors, however, it becomes significant. It's a subgroup analysis, but the hazard ratio is 0.69. That is a 30% reduction in recurrence rate in those patients. There is a real trend towards improved survival, particularly for colon cancer-specific survival, that, su that goes out beyond five years. There is major downstaging with lower risk of incomplete resection. And this big thing, that TRG, tumor regression grade, is a good predictor of long-term outcome. In other words, we can look at the resected tumor and start to predict how it's going to behave afterwards and whether it's likely to benefit from that chemotherapy that you're giving. And we'll look at that again.
So Foxtrot did not reach its primary endpoint of two years, but moving six weeks of chemotherapy ahead of surgery without major addition to cost or patient burden of treatment was safe, downstage tumors, and there was a strong tend towards reduced two-year recurrence rate. It's now undoubtedly and widely used as a therapeutic option for locally advanced operable colon cancer. So where do we go? Well, I think the first thing is to look at Phil's data and ask, how does it work? It definitely downstages primary disease. It also downstages secondary disease. I think you have to realize that it is better tolerated than post-operative chemotherapy. They get more chemotherapy. So if chemotherapy works, then you're going to get more chemotherapy in the patients if you give it before surgery. And I think we have to acknowledge that that is part of this. Giving chemotherapy after major surgery is a challenge. The one that we kind of would like an answer to is micrometastases. And at the moment, we can't say what its effect on micrometastases might be, whether it's affecting micrometastases in the lungs or the liver or both, or in peritoneal disease. Um, but if we look at the recurrence pattern of the disease as it's happening in the patients, then we can start to hypothesize. And I will give you one, and I think it leads into the next talk, and that is that I think that the effect on peritoneal disease is less than the effect on systemic disease, looking at the pattern of recurrence. If you can understand, I'm just looking at early patterns. So can we stratify for predicted benefit? Yes, we can. We definitely can. The mismatch repair gene state, the status actually will help determine whether someone is likely to respond to that chemotherapy or not. And we have to think about how we want to use that. Last month, published in the New England Journal, was the same data, but in gastric cancer, showing exactly the same effect. And can we stratify for predicted benefit for post-op chemotherapy? Well, yes, I think we can, because those non-responders, which are actually 30% of the whole population, they don't seem to be getting a good benefit from their adjuvant chemotherapy. They're still getting a recurrence rate in excess of 25% at two years. So those patients are doing really badly, and we need to look at alternative therapies for them, because I don't think the therapy we're giving at the moment is working. So to conclude, clinical implications. Now, advanced disease, we need to think about whether we should be using uh, uh, the, the current therapies for mismatch repair deficient tumors. In elderly patients, we need to be thinking about whether we should be giving preoperative chemotherapy to these patients, because it seems to work. And we've got new predictive biomarkers, both for PMMR status and for post-operative therapy. I suppose I would ask you as a population of surgeons, if you have a patient aged 65 with no obstructive features, locally advanced colonic cancer, and biopsy shows preserved mismatch repair function, what would you be offering those patients? Would you be offering them neoadjuvant therapy, three cycles of combination? Because their likelihood of benefit from that is very high. So the future studies, I just want to finish with this now and ask us to think about where we might be going. I think we have to look at alternative therapies for mismatch repair deficient tumors. That's about 20% of this population. It's a lot of patients. And immunotherapy is clearly a place we should be looking at there. In high risk, uh, uh, mismatch repair proficient tumors, can we escalate therapy and, and identify patients who might benefit to more uh, aggressive chemotherapy regimens, particularly for these non-responders? In frail and elderly patients, should we be introducing neoadjuvant therapy as a standard? And finally, I just ask you to think globally about health care and cancer, because in most of the world, we cannot deliver adjuvant chemotherapy to patients, both for safety and practical reasons. And perhaps in, in low- and middle-income countries, a neoadjuvant strategy for colon cancer would be safer, would increase efficacy and reduce cost, and maybe delivered more reliably. So it might be that studies across the global health care for colon cancer could be, show the biggest benefits from this strategy. 
So here's the Foxtrot 2 and 3 that's in development. And I'm just going to walk through that for a minute. Patients with potentially operable colon cancer, CT stage T3 and above, should have a multidisciplinary assessment and MMR status done. That MMR status, if it's, pres if it's MMR preserved and you feel that they're too frail for more aggressive therapy, then they can go into Foxtrot 2. If they are robust, young and fit patients, then we can look at a more, a more aggressive arm. So in the frail arm, Foxtrot 2, we would randomize patients between straight to surgery and six weeks of neoadjuvant oxaliplatin and 5-FU. In Foxtrot 3, where we have more robust patients, we'd give them, randomize them between the Foxtrot arm of six weeks of oxaliplatin and 5-FU versus six weeks of Folfox Erie. And that's a regimen that's being used in pancreatic cancer and one that we think should be considered for colon cancer. I think we're going to need studies for mismatch repair deficient tumors. And this platform also gives you the opportunity for introducing targeted therapies. We are discussing these, this trial on the 15th of January uh, next year in Birmingham. And uh, myself, uh, Phil's team, uh, Matt Seymour and Jenny Seligman will be there. And if there are partners in the Foxtrot Collaborative that would like to come, you'd be extremely welcome. I'm going to leave that slide and stop there. Thank you very much.